Welcome viewers to our ongoing program, Nuclear Free Future Conversation, coming to you from Channel 17 Town Meeting TV, Center for Media and Democracy here in Burlington, Vermont. I'm your host, Margaret Harrington, and viewers, let's welcome remotely from their different locations, Kevin Camps from Beyond Nuclear and Alfred C. Meyer from Physicians for Social Responsibility. Welcome Kevin Camps, welcome Alfred Meyer to Nuclear Free Future Conversation. Thanks so much, Margaret. Thank you, Margaret. Good to be here. Good, it's good to see you and, and hear you again. And here we are coming up to the 75th year since the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the title of our program we have agreed upon is 75 years of nuclear fallout from Hiroshima to now. So Kevin and Alfred, could you please start us out as agreed with the, the, an overview of the history of nuclear weapons and nuclear power and the significant 75th anniversary is being observed this year. Thank you so much. I'll jump in. Um, it's been, a really powerful time, uh, a very sobering time. Uh, just yesterday um, was the 75th anniversary of the Trinity Blast in New Mexico. So groups like the Tularosa Basin Downwinders Consortium held their annual commemoration, uh, had to do it remotely this year, but it is just so sobering. I mean, they, they did an hour long online commemoration and they ended it by reading hundreds of names of mostly Hispanic, um, but also Native American and also white American uh, folks who died because of the fallout from the Trinity Blast on July 16th, 1945. Some of them died within years, others uh, died decades later, but these were cancers and other diseases caused by the massive radioactive fallout from that particularly dirty nuclear weapons detonation, which happened to be the first in history. So that is beginning a few weeks now, as you mentioned, uh, coming up the 75th anniversary of the Hiroshima atomic bombing, followed just three days later by the Nagasaki commemoration. So a very, uh, very significant commemoration this time because the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, and New Mexico, um, many of them will not be living to see the 100th commemoration. So this is a very important one to hear their stories. A lot of us are not familiar with the Trinity at all because that was like a test, wasn't it? Yes, it the was. Trinity? The, no. the uh, <clears throat> Manhattan Project was confident that a uh, uh, uranium bomb would explode. So they never even tested the uranium bomb before they dropped that on Hiroshima on August 6th. 1945. But three weeks before they dropped the plutonium bomb on Nagasaki, uh, August 9th, 1945, uh, they did have to test it because it was a much more complicated device and, and much different technology. And so the Trinity test was the first test of this plutonium-based bomb. And it dispersed huge amounts of plutonium, 10 pounds uh, 10 of the 13 pounds of the plutonium that were in the test did not fission, which meant they were sent as particulates throughout uh, the environment. And with air and uh, water carrying it, it can go far and far. Um, and these particles remain dangerous. The half-life's 24,000 years, so it's dangerous for 240,000 years. We've, we've spread this stuff in the very first act of using one of these things. We've spread gross contamination throughout the world that'll be dangerous for generations to come. Alfred, at the time, do you, what, what was, what happened physically to the people in the Trinity, in, in, around Trinity, that was in New Mexico, right? Yes, there was a lot of fallout, kind of uh, almost like snow and ash uh, coming down for many days afterwards. And these are people who have just open cisterns for their water supplies. You know, it's a very uh, living on the land agrarian area. 
which the government described as being empty, but which really contained something like 30,000 people, you know, living on small little farms and whatnot. Um, but so this got into their, it stained their sheets. Uh, somebody had their sheets on the uh, clothesline drying and this radioactive ash stained it. Um, of course, radioactivity, you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it. So the dirty ash you could, and the radioactive dust, you could see. But this got spread throughout the area. And th there was no effort to monitor the dose amount, nor to follow up, do any kind of in, uh, epidemiological study to see what, what are the effects. You know, the, it, it actually was a uh, unplanned, un, you know, poorly run human study on radiation. That's horrible, horrible to, yeah. to hear on, on every point. Uh, plus, uh, I have a question though, Alfred, about why was there was no testing of the bomb on uh, before Hir Hiroshima? There was no testing of that bomb beforehand? Not, not of the, they were confident about the design of the uranium uh, weapon. Uh, it's, it's a fairly simple, I mean, it, it's, it's an incredible feat to split the atom, uh, but um, they were confident they could do it with the uranium. Kevin might have more details on uh, that. No, it's an important point because it shows, you know, here we are 75 years later past the Manhattan Project. These weapons designs have been out there for a long time. I mean, the Soviets had spies at Los Alamos, at the Montreal, Quebec, Canadian Atomic Lab during the Manhattan Project. They had a lot of information and where Leslie Groves of the Pentagon thought that the U.S. would have a monopoly for 15 years, they only had one for four, the United States, because the Soviets detonated their first weapon in 1949, a test. But the uranium weapons design used at Hiroshima is so straightforward that, you know, 70, 75 years later, it just indicates how dangerous nuclear weapons proliferation is because a lot of folks in the world have had this design in hand for a long time. So that's something we need to worry about is the proliferation of these very straightforward nuclear weapons designs I wanted to jump back real quick because you asked Margaret about the, um, the health impact on the people of New Mexico downwind of Trinity. And our colleagues, uh, Kitty Tucker and Bob Alvarez published a study that appeared in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists a year ago and was just republished because here it is the 75th annual commemoration. And this was Kitty's last work. Actually, it was published posthumously shortly after she passed on. It was incredible uh, what she did. She did the primary research was to look at the uh, pediatric health records of New Mexico for the years 1945, 1946, the months in question. There was a dramatic increase in uh, miscarriages and stillbirths that happened in the immediate aftermath of Trinity, undeniably related in the, in the counties downwind. And on the commemoration held by the Trinity downwinders yesterday, one of the stories that was told was that, of course, people noticed that there was this dramatic increase in infant mortality. And they actually contacted the Manhattan Project. They contacted the US military. They, they contacted the authorities and were trying to bring attention and get help. And they were met with silence and denial. And there's a op-ed that appeared in the, in the New York Times yesterday that essentially is entitled, The Day We Bombed America. And it made the very um, important point. It cited this, um, Kitty Tucker and Bob Alvarez piece, and it said the first victims of the atomic age were American babies. And yes, they happened to be Hispanic and Native American, and some were white, but um, just ghoulish, just awful. And one of the quotes in this op-ed that just floored me was a, a doctor associated with the Manhattan Project who essentially said, and this was a quote, that we got away with it. We got away with it. I was just okay. saying that Kitty Tucker was um, demanding justice in her article for the people of New Mexico, the Trinity Downwinders. And that is what the Trinity Downwinders are still calling for. Their slogan is uh, 75 years later and still waiting. And uh, they said that that response by the Manhattan Project, the fledgling Atomic Energy Commission, the 
federal officials, the military officials in New Mexico, who they reached out to in their desperation and their crisis of losing babies in large numbers, that that was unforgivable. And they have not forgotten that. The, we have to remember that the Manhattan Project was a super secret endeavor. Um, when Truman took over from FDR, even though Truman was vice president, he didn't even know the whole program was underway. And it had built in 1942 an industry the same size as the then automobile industry. So this is a massive enterprise that involves many different moving parts. But that was all done in secret. And that secrecy applies both to the health impacts uh, that you know they haven't really been looked into well or carefully uh, or given much credit uh, and also the operation of the whole endeavor and that uh, area that, that problem of secrecy is maintained to this day and uh, I you know the, the uh, I feel that the health data has been hijacked by the industry and the military they don't want to admit you know the, the atomic workers the, the people who worked in the factories that built up, you know, at one point the world had 72,000 warheads, nuclear warheads. So there was a lot of workers making, working with a lot of dangerous stuff and they were injured and damaged and made sick. And although there's a government program, the radiation, uh, what is it, Kevin, RECA? Um, radiation Exposure Compensation Act. Compensation Act yeah. Uh, which is supposed to honor these atomic veterans. In fact, even though a fair amount of money is spent every year, it's for the administration of the program and very few awards are made because the government doesn't want to admit the liability. It doesn't want to admit the harm it's caused and is still causing. So what you're saying is there was an awareness right at the detonations of, these first, of, the, of the bomb testing that there was a great danger to the personnel who were involved, as well as the people who were not considered at all in the surrounding district in New well, Mexico. The, the, yes, uh, and, and in fact, there was serious discussion by the people doing the test as to whether or not the Trinity test would burn up the Earth's atmosphere. This was a serious scientific concern, so they went ahead and did the test. I mean, this is um, the kind of power we're up against in this endeavor. And it, it still is the centerpiece of US defense policy, even though we have the largest by far conventional forces, a huge military, um, it's our nuclear weapons that are the trump card. Right. But we, we need to move on to, to the actual bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, August 6th, August 9th, 1945. And the great number of people who were killed and affected by the radiation fallout at that time. So Kevin, would you continue on with that about what happened on those two days? Well, um hundreds of thousands of people were instantly killed by the blast and the fires um, in each city. And then many more people would die over months and years and decades to come because of their exposure to the harmful radioactivity that was released. So these were genocidal weapons. Um, there's a book called uh, the Decision to Use the Atomic Bomb by Gar Alperowitz, which came out in 1995 on the 40th anniversary of the bombings, that made very compelling arguments that those bombs were not needed. They did not have to happen. And he quoted people like Eisenhower and Leahy, who was commander of the Navy, who said the war was over. We did not need to hit those people with these things. We were not taught to wage war that way. And uh, Incredibly enough, um, Arjun Makajani, who we were talking about the harm to the nuclear weapons workforce and the neighboring communities to these facilities that make the bombs, he wrote a book called um, Nuclear Wastelands about that. He was a co-author. He also, in his research, found out that the US Department of Energy listed Trinity as the first atomic weapons test, followed by 
Hiroshima and Nagasaki as the second and third nuclear weapons tests. And uh, when he brought attention to this, it was such a shameful admission by the Department of Energy that these were tests, that um, they actually removed them from that list, but you know, the truth was out. And there's a lot of truth to that. These were tests. And actually, um, as Gar Alperowitz wrote in that book, um, The Decision to Use the Atomic Bomb, this was a message to the Soviets that the United States yeah, was delivering. Was. We are the superpower, yeah. we are in charge. You need to stop your armies uh, in Manchuria, don't come any closer to Japan. And it was used in Eastern Europe as well um, to draw the line between East and West, so to speak. And it's been used that way ever since. I mean, there's this notion that nuclear weapons have only been used twice by the United States on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In fact, they've been used ever since. It's like a bank robber with a gun. The bank robber may not pull the trigger, but the bank robber is using that gun to rob the bank. And so that's how the United States and other nuclear weapons powers use nuclear weapons. They, they are the trump card in their back pocket. And uh, it puts the entire planet at, at risk. And Alfred, could you go into the, the, uh, the union, like the two sides of the same coin between nuclear weapons and nuclear power? And yes. when, when you put forward an idea for this program, you said that nuclear power is, uh, that nuclear weapons are, are necessary for nuclear power and vice versa, that it, it, it that's, this is how it's, it's so conjoined. Well, I, I believe what I said is that nuclear weapons are, um, excuse me, nuclear power, civilian nuclear power is an integral part of our nuclear weapons complex. And um, just today I came across an additional report from the Atlantic Council, which is a high, highbrow uh, think tank in Washington. And they were very specific that we have to have civilian nuclear power, that they even come up with the number of $42.8 billion that civilian nuclear power contributes towards our nuclear weapons defense, our national, they always call it national security. And they talk about, I, I, I won't read the quotes right now, but um, you know, that, that if, if this was not the case, that we, it would be a terrible shock to the economy and to our national security. And so this is 2019 in October. Uh, in 2017, Ernie Moniz, who was the uh, one Obama's second Secretary of Energy, who actually both of them were highly respected, uh, highly trained physicists and scientists. But Ernie Moniz wrote a report in uh, 2017 talking about, again, how uh, civilian nuclear power is fundamental to our national security. If you go on the Nuclear Energy uh, Institute's website, that's the uh, pro-industry promotion group, uh, under uh, advantages, they have a headline called advantages, and if you look under the advantages, if you look at security, it shows a picture of a, a woman of color in army fatigues holding what appears to be her daughter, uh, also in fatigues, and this uh, statement is, civilian nuclear power is fundamental for our national security. So I give him credit for being much more honest about um, what this is, because in the past, um, I've, I've talked to many people who are pro-nuclear power who say, oh, we hate weapons. We don't want anything to do with weapons. Get rid of them all, but nuclear power, you know, that's what's gonna save us from climate change even though it can't for many reasons. Um, so the real reason it's pushed for is to the capacity for the military. We might have heard of small modular reactors. Take a little reactor on a train car out to Kansas someplace and bingo, they'd have you know clean energy like magic. Well, what that really is for, it's not for Topeka, Kansas, it's really for new reactors for atomic submarines. It's really for the military. And there are stories like this in Britain. Um, you know, I'm just finding more and more uh, official acknowledgement of this because they've tried to support nuclear power on its, you know, environmental uh, uh, basis 
but it's so unbelievably expensive and difficult that um, you know they, they, that argument doesn't fly. So now they're they're being honest. We need it for bombs. And Kevin, could you go forward with the nuclear fuel chain that from mining to waste and how it's harmful at every step and how the conjoined forces of nuclear power and and uh, nuclear nuclear weapons Margaret are, yes if I could interrupt and uh, I, I think we'd like to just round out this discussion of nuclear of weapons course, Alfred, a couple please. more uh, yeah. comments um, one is that you know, the, I will mention that in 1953, President Eisenhower started what was called a program called Atoms for Peace. And I see this as an attempt to put a smiley face on this ghastly experience the world had of seeing two cities incinerated in an instant. Um, the world was horrified. So this was an effort to, number one, make it a happy face. We're going to bring you energy too cheap to meter even though the studies at the time said it, the biggest problem with nuclear was cost. But anyway, um, and this also became a huge program of nuclear proliferation. We built nuclear reactors all over the world in all different societies with all different safety standards and governmental structures and whatnot. We spread nuclear all over. Uh, we, we just are almost at the end of getting all that uranium back from all these places we've sent it. But you know, that's from the 50s. And um, so anyway, but then I wanted to ask Kevin just to mention that, you know, there um, are important commemorations of the 75th bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There's a website you can go to, uh, Hiroshima Nagasaki 75.org. And you can uh, find an event near you. You can set up an event. You can find resources. You can uh, take action in your community and, and join together with your community, I think, for support. Because this is a terrible story we're telling. And it's going on. It's getting worse. We're just in the throes of the restart of an arms race, a nuclear arms race with Russia. But Kevin, add to that, please. Yes, um, you know, uh, because I'm doing so much work in New Mexico these days on the uh, Holtec high level radioactive waste dump, I'm tuned into the commemorations happening in New Mexico. We spoke about Trinity, but there's gonna be a major commemoration that's focused on Los Alamos. It's organized by a coalition of New Mexicans. And um, this happens every year at Los Alamos on August 6th for Hiroshima, on August 9th for Nagasaki. Because of the pandemic, it's going to be remote by computer this time. They're going to have a lineup of speakers. It's going to be combined with nonviolence training to, you know, walk our talk. And uh, this will be a major one. As I said, um, many of the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki are, are now in their 70s at least and will not be around for the 100th most likely. So um, this is it to hear from them. And that is a very significant, for a major anniversary, of course, they'll be back next year. But um, I wanted to answer Margaret's question about this uh, nuclear fuel chain by pointing to another commemoration that was held in New Mexico yesterday by the Nuclear Issues Study Group, a group that's about several years old now. We are allies in the fight against Holtec, for example. They had an incredible panel of speakers, including Congolese and South African speakers yesterday. And who were the first victims of the Manhattan Project? It, it wasn't the Trinity downwinders. They were the first downwinders, yes. But what about the uranium miners in Congo, uh, the local residents downstream and downwind of the Shinko Lobwe um, mine? And it's a remarkable story. The uranium ore there was very rich. Where most uranium ore in the world is less than 1% uranium, this ore was 65% uranium. Very rich in uranium and its uh, radioactive progeny, which happened to be very hazardous. And so that mining at the so-called Belgian Congo uranium mine that fueled the Manhattan Project was incredibly harmful to the miners and their families and the other local residents. And so those stories were told last night. There is a recording of that event 
at Nuclear Issues Study Group. So if folks don't know this story, please check it out. And it indicated what was to come here in this country and around the world. And many times the uranium mining takes place on indigenous people's lands in the Four Corners, Navajo Diné and Pueblo Indian. In fact, Los Alamos, uh, very near a uranium mining district, uh, was built on top of Pueblo Indian communities, essentially. Their sacred lands, their burial grounds, their residential communities nearby, downstream, downwind of Los Alamos. So this is from the very beginning that indigenous peoples have been harmed at every stage. Another commemoration we didn't mention yet, but it was a very ironic date, July 16th, again, only 1979, the biggest radiological release in U.S. history happened on July 16th, 1979. The Church Rock, New Mexico, uranium mill tailings dam breach, where tens of millions of radioactive and toxic wastewater flowed through a breach in an earthen dam into the Puerco River, which is the sole source of drinking water and irrigation water for Navajo Diné shepherds downstream into Arizona. So um, that was also commemorated yesterday um, by groups like the, the Red Water Pond Road Community Association, a Diné Navajo group, and another one, the Eastern Navajo Diné Against Uranium Mining, NDOM. So just uh, July 16th is a, is a very somber um, day of mourning in New Mexico. And just to give you a, a sense of the ghoulish tone deafness of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they chose July 16th in 2018 to begin the Holtec licensing proceeding for this high level radioactive waste dump. We're, you know, as there are the, the people promoting this, the head of the National Nuclear Security Administration, for instance, was at Los Alamos yesterday, uh, lauding all the benefits that this nuclear age has brought to us. Uh, and, and in my mind, ignoring all the problems that we've been talking about today. And that it really ties in with current events uh, in our country now in terms of George Floyd, racism, uh, economic colonialism, and the, the effects of capitalism, that um, we're seeing that uh, so much of this story, the nuclear story really is about the environmental injustices to so many people, the downwinders, the uh, uh, native peoples, the, um, you know, all, also many of the parts of the nuclear weapons complex uh, that work, which again is polluting at every step, is done in neighborhoods where poorer and black and brown communities live. And I think that just as the uh, Black Lives Matter movement is trying to restructure uh, where guns are, take them out of the hands of the police and have, you know, really address the issues at hand. I think too, now's the time to defund nuclear weapons and to get rid of them, that the entire world, you know, is threatened by Donald Trump's finger on the button. He has sole authority to push that. He doesn't have to ask anybody, he doesn't have to get anybody's permission. And this is a grave risk of actually blowing ourselves up. But even if we don't blow ourselves up, just to have these things at all means that a vast number of populations and places are horribly damaged and polluted. Kevin and, and Alfred, let's talk about the 75th anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and yeah. opportunities for in action and engagement, okay? So let's just segue into that at this point, okay? Without my question and maybe, maybe uh, which one of you wants to start that, Alfred or, or Kevin? Sure, ahead, um, Kevin. I would um, just, uh, you know, hold up the Hibakusha of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, in 2017, they are the survivors. The, the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The the Japanese word is habakusha. Um, they were on stage with uh, the international campaign for the abolition of nuclear weapons, uh, ICAN, 
in receiving the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. And the speaker, uh, a survivor of Hiroshima, who is uh, Japanese Canadian, uh, Satsuko Thurlow, spoke very powerfully at the Nobel Peace Prize award ceremony. And uh, really, it was a rallying cry to support this treaty that is really making progress. It began in 2017. ICANN was honored for its role in getting this going this grassroots international campaign. And uh, just in the past week, two more countries have ratified the treaty, um, Fiji and Botswana. And now that brings the number of ratifications up to 40. There are 10 more to go. And I'm hopeful that with this 75th anniversary of the atomic bombings that more countries will do the right thing right now and get this done because at 50 ratifications, this becomes binding international law. And not only the nuclear weapons powers, but the other countries that live under the nuclear umbrella, so to speak, countries like Canada and the NATO European countries, uh, they will then be outside of international law because of their support for these prohibited weapons, these prohibited weapons of mass destruction called nuclear weapons. So it's very hopeful. It's tremendous good work coming at a critical time when the Trump administration is ripping up arms control and non-proliferation treaties that have been on the books for a half century in some cases. Uh, it's a very dangerous time, as Alfred said, and it's an important time to leverage these anniversaries towards positive action to protect our planet and all its inhabitants. And I think that the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons is, in my mind, a real bright spot. We've been having this discussion today, and uh, you know, in a sober analysis of it, it's, it's pretty depressing stuff. But I really see this as an effort um, uh, that's very hopeful and very possible. It's an effort that uh, at the UN went through the General Assembly so that the uh, Member, the permanent members of the Security Council who are all nuclear weapons powers could not veto this effort. This was democracy breaking out at the UN and the, the countries who really would suffer from the use of these horrible weapons are saying we shouldn't have them. And again, this is where I see a similarity with the, um, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is that we are need to change the whole normative way of thinking of our society and, and change what we value, change what we pursue. The pursuing nuclear weapons it will not give us security. It puts us at much greater risk. Um, and it's unjust to so many other people. And the huge amounts of money used for that could do so much else for the whole world. So I think that uh, people should also know that there's an effort called Back from the Brink and their website is www.preventnuclearwar.org, preventnuclearwar.org. And there again, you can find out what's going on in your community or find out a way to get uh, start something in your community, but to put pressure on our elected officials uh, to, to say we don't want this huge amounts of money going into nuclear efforts. Uh, the Department of Energy has just issued a report saying how we have to reassert our position as the leader, lead competitor of you know, nuclear exports and nuclear technology, and we have to subsidize more uranium mining and create great stockpile, you know, on and on and on. You can do a whole story on that uh, one report, but it's, this is what's driving things, is this big push to bolster and uh, refurbish the whole nuclear weapons complex. And we don't need the nuclear power, we don't need the nuclear weapons. We'll be much better without, without them. On that note, Alfred Meyer, Physicians for Social Responsibility, and Kevin Camps of Beyond Nuclear, we will end part one of our program. And viewers, we will return for part two. And uh, please stay tuned to us. Thank you, Channel 17, Center for Media and Democracy. Mm -hmm. That's all for now. Thank you for viewing.